Hi everybody, my name is Grace Bobek and um, this is a conversation with Joan Ravinsky for a special event in the Living from Love series um, and it's called Facing Death. And I'll be speaking with Joan Ravinsky. Hi Joan. Hello Grace. And um, welcome very much and thank you so much for agreeing to, to do this conversation which is pre-recorded because Joan has terminal cancer and her energy levels are very variable now and um, so we decided that we would pre-record this this conversation so that she could join us at a time when her energy is relatively decent. Um, I appreciate very much. Thank you. Yes, yes. And you know, I appreciate and I know, I know a lot of people appreciate being able to hear from you because obviously they're touched by um, what you're going through and you know, the fact that you won't be with us for that much longer, who knows how much longer, but uh, not that much longer. And um, so there is also just a precious opportunity to speak to somebody who really does face death in a very direct and, and pretty imminent way. So so thank you. Thank you for joining us, Joan. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to this topic because I know that there's a lot of fear and misunderstanding about what death is. So your uh, series is going to be, I think, a benefit to, to many people and I appreciate um, being part of it. Yes, yes. And, and oh, what... I appreciate it so much and I know a lot of people do. So let me just say a little bit about you before for those people who don't know you, Joan. Yes. Um, so Joan is a yoga teacher and spiritual teacher in the spiritual, um, she, she, sorry, in the pathless yoga uh, mm. tradition if that can be called a tradition or approach. And she had the, um, she sat with Jean Klein or Klein um, for 10 years. And that was really uh, what influenced her in her way of teaching yoga and also her spiritual teaching. Um, I shouldn't say too much, Joan, because I don't know all the details, but I know that that's really the non-dual understanding and um, way that you share with people, even though, of course, it's not a way. And um, I just want to add on a personal note that I used to go to uh, meditation and chanting evenings with mm -hmm. Joan a long time ago when I was still living in Montreal. And I know we share that um, love of chanting, which I still do. I don't know whether you still do, Joan. Every day. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And, um, you know, so at the time when I knew you, you weren't really offering spiritual teachings as such yet, maybe as part of your yoga classes, which I never went to. But I know you had a friend of yours and fellow um, uh, I don't know, disciple is not quite the right word, but um, uh, fellow person who was present with Jean Klein also, um, who's, who's uh, Eric Barré, and you had him come to Montreal and give talks. 
And I certainly appreciated those at the time. Yes, um, Eric Barre <clears throat> came to Montreal uh, up until just recently. His health is also failing, and we oh. both are students of Jean Klein. Uh, we mm -hmm. have been, uh, he's been with Jean Klein longer than I have. He started, I think, when he was in his 20s, and I didn't start until I was in my 40s. But uh, we've both been uh, students of Jean for many, many years. Mm. Mm. So you do call yourself a student of Jean. <laughs> I wasn't I do. sure about that. I, I do. You know, I mean, he always emphasized that we should be speaking of each other as spiritual friends. But there was also this part of me that was very reverential. And I, it was almost impossible not to say student because I felt that his vision at the time when I first met him was so vast. That it was, uh, uh, it was, it was immensity itself, yes. and I sensed that I was, I was, not sharing the same enormity of vision. Now mm. I see that if you don't see with the personal eyes, that it's not a question of uh, size or dimension or dimensionlessness. It just is. Mm. But at the time. It was very much a question of, I looked very much up at him as a, a guide and a mentor. Now mm -hmm. I understand completely what he meant by spiritual friend. Mm -hmm. We're all spiritual friends, all of us. Yes, yes we are. And you know, as somebody who has had a teacher herself, um, and I still, you know, I, I don't, feel the need for teacher anymore but but you know gangaji was my teacher at the mm -hmm. time and um that was very precious for me and you know there is in time there is a need for teacher if there is and um then a teacher is very precious and when it's time to let go of the teacher then there is more of just a, a sense of spiritual friendship. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. When Jean died, that was in 1998, uh, I think it was then that the teachings really started to grow in me. When mm. I stopped seeing him uh, in a reverential kind of way, it was then I was able to integrate the teachings. So mm -hmm. in a way, my death is a really good thing for all the people that I've in influenced. <laughs> it's probably the only way that some of, uh, some of them can come into their own. Mm. Yes, yes. It's like fertilizing the flora of the forest. Mm. And, and it's also like just... Um, a passing on of the torch, you know, it's like somehow as long as it burns in us, it's like maybe not quite time to pass it on yet. And when it's time to pass it on, others will take it up. Oh, it's time. <laughs> For me, it's time. <laughs> it's very much time to pass on the torch. And I've been so, so lucky to have fantastic people around me who have really assimilated to a very great degree, what I have assimilated from Jean. Mm. And it's all just unfolding perfectly. Mm. Mm. The teachings are forever. Mm. The teachers change, but the mm. teachings continue through yes. different mouths, through different ways of expression, through different uh, dialects, but the, the essence of the teachings are always the same. Mm. Yes, yes, totally. And we take to different flavors and different tastes mm -hmm. um, naturally. And so it's beautiful that there is just this whole manifold expression of teachings, mm -hmm. of the one teaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been, uh, I've been incredibly lucky to have this opportunity to be dying. 
I just feel, you know, that I, I know a lot of people don't agree with me on this. We've had some discussions about it. But when it was first announced to me that I was dying or that I had uh, terminal cancer, this is, oh, I don't know, 18 months ago, something like that, mm -hmm. um, that I was already stage four, uh, I was overjoyed. I was mm -hmm. absolutely overjoyed. It was, it was a reaction I didn't expect. I don't have any expectations about that sort of thing. But I had been coughing for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those experiences of sudden radical, radical joy, realizing that I am also able to have the human experience Mm. as well as uh, uh, the, I don't really sort of relate 100% to the human experience, uh, but this experience of dying uh, is such a, uh, an imperative to really understand so deeply how we're not the body. Mm -hmm. We're not just the body. The body is just an emanation of who we really are. So it's like there's this vast field of beingness and then, and then a little bloop that comes up, you know, that mm -hmm. comes into its individuality and then it goes mm -hmm. back down into the mm -hmm. vast field. And, uh, you know, to experience that directly is such a privilege. Well, of course, everybody experiences it directly uh, mm -hmm. at some point or another. But for me, it was just uh, an opportunity to feel this tremendous joy. Mm -hmm. tremendous joy of what it really means, what these teachings mean in a very visceral kind of way, mm -hmm. that we're, mm -hmm. we're not just the body, we're not yes. just the mind. And I remember when um, Jean uh, had, a, had a few strokes, his uh, uh, language ability and his uh, motor ability uh, were very severely impaired. And I think there were some people who misunderstood because he wasn't, you know, able to express the teachings anymore. But sitting in his presence, even though his mm -hmm. mind and his intellectual ability had uh, really uh, 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 been reabsorbed into the one, um, he was, uh, his presence was so powerful, incredibly powerful, mm -hmm. that it didn't matter that he couldn't express the teachings verbally. Mm -hmm. And, and I heard some people say, well, well, that means that he wasn't really enlightened because enlightened people don't do that. Well, you know, Jean never even talked about enlightenment. Mm -hmm. He didn't even speak of it that way. So, uh, you know, in a way, I was strongly influenced by how he, uh, how he was when he was in his last year, six months, when I would visit him in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was also strongly influenced, I think, in my attitude by my own family. And one of the mm -hmm. things that I learned from my family was uh, that you don't have to be spiritual to face death completely uh, uh, quietly. My mm -hmm. father didn't have a spiritual bone in his body. He was a scientist. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was perfectly, completely relaxed about the whole dying process. My uh, uh, sister was uh, very spiritual and was very perturbed at the end. She was not mm. at peace. So this whole notion of your attitudes about spiritual and not spiritual have nothing to do with how we face death. Mm. It's entirely uh, uh, not a question of the mind. Oh, and I don't know even how we could say it. You can learn all sorts of things. You can mm. learn about how we're not the body, we're not the mind. Um, and yet, when it actually comes down to it, everybody dies their own way. And it mm. doesn't mean they've done it wrong. It doesn't mean they're not facing it correctly. There's no such thing as a spiritually correct death. It mm -hmm. just is. It mm -hmm. manifests the way it manifests. Because everything is consciousness. Everything. Fear is a sort of consciousness. It's a contracted consciousness, yes, yes but it's still consciousness. Mm. Mm. Capital C consciousness. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, so is the body, you know. I of mean, course. It's an emanation of consciousness. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can I have mm. a sip of water here? Go ahead. So Joan, I'm, I'm very happy you started with that joy because that was the first question I, I was getting to. 
<laughs> so you've already answered that. And and I'd like to go a, a, a just a little bit deeper into that. Um, what's the what's the essence of that joy? I mean, you know, once get once people get over this initial maybe um, you know. I wouldn't say shock, maybe, um, but uh, there is a certain, you know, there is a certain understanding of death, you know, which is basically the survival uh, personality-based understanding, which is that death has to be avoided at all costs. Um, so for somebody to respond with what you call radical joy you know can can be surprising to say the least and when to the extent that these teachings are understood obviously that makes a lot of sense but maybe you could just go into this you know just tell us about this joy more well, I think the first thing that comes to me is is that the joy comes from uh, the immediacy of going home. It's not that we're not home all the time. Mm -hmm. After a certain you know point in our evolution, if you if you wish, or our recognition, let's call it recognition, um, we know who we are, mm -hmm. but there are always the distractions of the grocery shopping and the whatever all projects that have to be done in the daily world. And it's not that it really distracts us from uh, this wholeness that we are, but when we realize the imminence of uh, the disappearance of all distraction, that we can entirely devote ourselves to this wholeness that we are, this uh, uh, radical beauty, this uh, mm. incredible presence, uh, that, that is, that is, it's like a, I don't know how to describe it, it's really hard to describe. What mm. has to be described is that uh, we don't have to worry about any of the distractions anymore, we mm. are going home, we are home, and uh, we always have been home, and it makes it so much more present. I think mm. that the sense of presence becomes uh, accentuated. It's not that mm. we know it. It's not that there's anything to understand. Mm. You know, really, it's if we go beyond understanding. It's just it's yeah. just a straight outright recognition, and the mm. joy comes from ah, what a relief. What a relief mm. that, yeah, of course I had to make a will and I had to, you know, uh, have the front of the house painted because it eventually will be sold and, you know, mm. all the practical details of getting ready to check out. But, um, you know, basically checking out is saying, ah, I don't have to do any of the side issues anymore. Uh, mm. The devotion to the truth is complete. Mm. That's mm. how I see it. Mm -hmm. The source of the joy is the recognition that we don't even have to, well, obviously we have to be true to the physical plane, but that it is uh, uh, no longer needs to be the distraction that it seems to be during our so-called everyday life, mm -hmm. which itself is a miracle. Itself is a miracle. So are you saying that in that radical joy, even the everyday seeming distractions can just be a joyful way of, of being, can be included in the joy? And they yeah, aren't quite yes, involved. but not necessarily. You know, I mean, if a contractor says he's going to be there at 9 o'clock in the morning and you set everything up for him and he doesn't show up until noon, there might be frustration. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be frustration, but it's not something that goes very deep. 
it's it, there's a kind of humor humor about it. Mm -hmm. One, I think, one develops a better sense of humor about it all. <laughs> That's part of it. Um, and I think the other part is uh, there's nothing the matter with our reactions and our reactivity to things. We don't have to change anything. We don't have to become some kind of perfect uh, being that is never irritated or upset or restless or anything like that. Uh, one of the things that I particularly don't like about the dying process is the pain. It's mm -hmm. not always there because I have a wonderful doctor who really, uh, she really is a specialist in palliative care and is very, very uh, uh, sensitive to how to work the dosages of the various medications. But there are times when there is pain. I'm not crazy about that. This body doesn't love pain. Um, of course, there's a whole teaching about the difference between pain and suffering, but at a certain, you know, in which, in which uh, yes, there may be pain, but there's no suffering. There's suffering if you understand, if you don't understand uh, mm -hmm. things in the proper perspective, but uh, otherwise there's just sensation. Well, mm -hmm. I would say that for me there are times when the sensation is so intense that I would call mm -hmm. it pain, and anyone looking at it from the outside would say, there is suffering. And mm -hmm. I don't see that as a problem. Mm -hmm. I really don't see that as a problem. Any more than I saw Jean Klein's frustration when we couldn't understand what he wanted for dinner as a problem. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we did figure out that what he was saying that he wanted for dinner, Eier, which doesn't mean anything in English, means eggs in German. Is that right? How do you pronounce it? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, mm -hmm. he, he, he was, you know, repeating Eier, Eier, and we did not understand what he meant. And finally, the, luckily, one of his German students was there who said, eggs, he wants eggs for dinner. You know, we didn't blame him for not being able mm -hmm. to speak. You know, we didn't blame him for being frustrated because we didn't understand him. Mm. You know, it was just, oh, okay. And that too. Mm. And that too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything can be included in this process. Yes. And it doesn't have to be a certain way. It doesn't, you know, I think some people do check out in absolute quietness and peace, and other people check out with a, a, a you know, a great deal of resistance. Mm. And I don't think we can predict how it's going to be for anybody. Yes. Everybody's different. Yeah. And it um, isn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily dependent on their quote unquote uh, level of recognition. Yes. Yes, totally. Um, and and let, let's get back to this. But before we do, you know, I just want to um, be clear about something that you mm -hmm. said, which is, um, in this process, everything's included, you know, even the frustrations and, the, you know, the dislike of pain. And Well, I would have thought that's already true even before, you know. I mean, it's, it's true any time. It's true any time that everything's included, you know. Absolutely. There's no need to... There's no need to be perfectly at peace all the time. Of course. Of course, yes. I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, there's that carrot in the, in the teachings, the, the, the carrot, oh, you'll be in perfect peace all the time, and yes. you're chasing after this carrot. The, mm -hmm. Drop the carrot and just come back home. Come back here. Yes. What yes. is? Yeah. What is now? Oh, yes. and this too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but very, very... Uh, Probably it's a very good uh, sales pitch, the carrot approach to spirituality. But ultimately, I think it's a disservice because then people who may have a very high degree of understanding, of not understanding, but recognition, then they, they feel, oh, I didn't get it. I have got it. I missed it. I've, I, somehow I've missed it. And they haven't missed it at all. They just aren't in that, they just haven't that last step of, mm -hmm. of total acceptance, you know, mm -hmm. total acceptance yes. of it all. Yes. You know, there's this radical acceptance, mm -hmm. you know, joy, acceptance, and recognition. Yes. yes. Wow. How amazing. <laughs> How amazing. Yes. Yes. We're so and, lucky and, you know, my my teacher Ganga Ji says you don't you don't you don't have to wait for death for for that 
to be true for that to be your life i mean it can be of course if you don't have be to recognize wait. before absolutely you know, that that is that is the awakening absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. yeah yeah the awakening is now right here yes it's yes. not off in the future mm -hmm. yeah the dawning of the truth isn't uh isn't something we need to put off or look forward to. It's it's this moment right now. Yes. yes. And uh, uh, I'm not I'm not saying that uh, uh, we have to revel in misery. I think that would be you know indulgence. But certainly we can uh, welcome it wholeheartedly. And mm -hmm. in that welcoming, we then mm -hmm. are out of the, the the resistance. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so um, let me get to this point of um, which you know I I I, th I feel is a really important one, which is that everybody's way of dying of of letting go of the body, it's as individual as their way of living. Mm, absolutely. And I just like to share something. Um, from my own experience of a friend who was um, I had tendencies of being depressed throughout his life and when he was diagnosed with uh, with cancer stage four at the time you know it didn't quite say it was terminal um, he he finally found a, a, a real joy in living in himself you know it's as if the very fact of being faced with death actually allowed him to live more fully and um, in the same way uh, my own experience was when I uh, when I was dealing with cancer for the second time there was a lot of fear that arose and somehow that fear, you know, it just arose, even though I was, uh, I was very spiritual at the time. I wasn't quite where I am now in terms of the, the, the depth of understanding maybe, but mm -hmm. um, this fear arose and it was very vivid at night. I, I was lying awake with it and, um, and there, there kept being, and at points it, the fear would just totally swamp me. And at other points, there was just a, a surrender to it, a, 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 a willingness for life to be whatever it was, whether it would come to an end sooner rather than later, or whether it would be longer. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very surprised by this. And actually you know, what this did was similarly, it actually allowed me to, to embrace life much more fully than I had before, because like a lot of spiritual people, there was always a bit of a, you know, just just a kind of suspicion of life or a, or a very, very, very subtle resistance to it mm -hmm. because it is a contraction, you know, and because mm -hmm when we come into this life relatively consciously, you know, there's a felt sense of suffering that somehow sure. kind of just comes upon us, you know? Well, yes, I mean, yeah. being born yeah. is a contraction. Yes, yes, yes. Um, in, in more than one sense, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just coming into this body is, is, is a, a, an experience of contraction, it has to be. Mm -hmm. So, um, so somehow being faced with this possibility of dying, you know, was, was actually really, uh, for me, it was just an opportunity to, to, to just let go so much more deeply into whatever was happening at that point. Um, and it turned out that there was a way of, you know, I'm still here, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this is, I think, 
what you're saying is really, really important because we have the fear of not existing. Mm. And then that turns into the joy of not existing. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, the fear of not existing is something that we not, um, it happens in the waking state, right? Mm. In, in, the, in the waking state as opposed to the dreaming or the sleep state. Mm. And when we're in deep sleep, we don't exist. Okay, there's yes. no sense of I. There's mm. no sense of I at all. So we spend, you know, eight hours a day with no I. There's no problem with that. We wake mm -hmm. up in the morning, and if we wake up very quickly, the I pops in before uh, we really take note that uh, there is consciousness before the I, mm -hmm. before the, the, the me, myself, I. Uh, and so there can be this fear of not existing mm. when we are faced with death. But if we are paying attention as much as possible to the possibility of there being no I when we're in deep meditation or when we're in deep sleep, uh, this is the waking wake-up bell to pay attention to that transition between the sleep state and the waking state just before the identification identification with the I. So mm. there's this moment where there's no I, but there mm. is consciousness. Same mm. thing as we're going to sleep. Yeah. Um, so in the beginning, there might be fear of, of not existing, but because we don't exist in deep meditation or in uh, uh, this transition zone or when we're in deep sleep uh, we get a little bit sort of uh, used to it we get used to being mm -hmm. dunked in non-being we get dunked in non-being and then we realize oh non-being and being are not separate they're not different from each other we go beyond being and non-being mm. so i think that the fear is a really beautiful wake-up bell to mm -hmm. uh, Go a little bit deeper, because yes. it's it's this business of we get used to not existing, but mm. it's not the we in the personal sense that get used gets used to not existing. It's this uh, pure consciousness as we look back at it. Uh, there is there was no problem. Mm. There was no problem. I was sound asleep. The I was sound asleep. Inus was sound asleep. Don't need that to exist because mm. existence is beyond. Existence, capital E, is beyond uh, little existence and non-existence. Yes. So it's a, I think the fear is, uh, it transforms into joy as we recognize that it, there doesn't have to be an I in order to exist in the capital E existence state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have not so far hit the fear place. I don't know if that's coming or not. When it comes, well, we'll see what happens. I'll let you know. I'll call you. <laughs> I just got that. But I, I mean, yeah. that doesn't mean that, that it's because I have some deep recognition or anything like that. It just happens that that hasn't uh, blown through the field of awareness. And, and it may not, you know, it may not. I, I, I think that's part of the individuality of the, of the human experience that, you know, for some, because it's such a deep mm -hmm. creaturely conditioning, you know, I mean, it's, it's just of kind of hardwired in our bodies. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for some, it will arise very strongly, like certainly for this, for this friend, it arose very strongly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for others, it may not arise. You may, you may not, yeah. you may not experience it at all. Absolutely true. And the other thing you said was uh, his experience was that he appreciated life more. Mm. And that has not been my experience. Uh, I have found... Uh, surprisingly that the joy comes from the possibility of not being mm -hmm. an experiencer with a whole bunch of experiences popping up on the screen that have yeah. to be dealt with yes. uh, 
So I have, I have, I sat through the 80s with many friends who died of AIDS uh, mm -hmm. very quickly, and their experience, very many of their experience, was that they felt uh, uh, much more appreciation of life. I have to say that because I uh, have radically slowed down, uh, I see more things than I saw before. I think I wrote in one of my newsletters that uh, lying in the back seat of a car allows you to see the flowers on the second story balconies in Montreal, which I never would have seen before because I was watching the road. <laughs> uh, you know, so yes, my appreciation of life is expanded in the sense that I'm seeing different things because I'm not focusing on the road or focusing on whatever uh, in and I mean going to the, the a farmers market in the autumn is absolutely beautiful I'm mm. not carrying the shopping bags I'm not pushing the wheelchair so I can see everything so mm. yes in that sense I can I can say my appreciation is enhanced but not because I'm dying mm -hmm. just because I'm sitting in a wheelchair and somebody else is taking care of the details my mm. blessed partner who takes care of everything. I'm so mm. lucky to have that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's responsible for a great deal of, of my wonderful experience of this dying mm. process. And um, I think that uh, we are beholden to our friends who are dying to help mm. them have this extraordinary experience of being able to let go and mm. be uh, in the state of pure observing rather mm. than participating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because in any case, the, the energy of participating, you know, it, it just diminishes, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And interest. And interest as we become more and more delighted with this openness of non-being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I'm wondering, you know, what um, what you think of this, um, not in an intellectual sense, um, but you know, my sense is also that the the I don't know, just the scripts that are there for our lives, you know, what is there to be experienced, what is there to be let go of. They're, they're um, you know, sometimes facing death can be a waking up experience that allows people to, to really open to life more fully because, you know, that's part of what, what their lives are all about. It's like facing death at that point isn't about really truly dying then, right there and then. It's really about, um, in a way, realizing the preciousness of this opportunity to be alive and to come yeah. alive fully, 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 you know, as fully and as deeply and as. Um, embracingly as possible uh, and that's very different from actually then really what you're describing which is which is truly going into death consciously into dying consciously which is a letting go you know it's it's a it's a letting go of that human experience bit by bit kind of thing you know, aspects of that very human experience of doing things, focusing, you know, having interests. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. that, that kind of diminishes over time and there's something very pure that just starts kind of radiating and shining through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There isn't a, an intellectual understanding of it. It really is a much more of a felt sense. But part of the felt sense is discovering where there is still contraction. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, very, very important. One of the, uh, I guess it's in the, 
the last rites in some some different churches uh, mm -hmm. different religions where they speak a lot about forgiveness forgiveness of mm -hmm. oneself and forgiveness of others and that can be something that uh, is uh, creating contraction that we don't know that we don't know consciously and mm -hmm. as we start to uncover those kinds of contractions we live much more in uh, the, the deep taking responsibility for where we might have hurt other people or where other people might have hurt us because we have hurt other people and that sort of thing. So I would say, yes, it leads us more deeply into life in the sense that it leads us more deeply into recognizing and releasing our contractions. And the contraction mm -hmm. might be, it might be guilt, or it might be shame, or it might be, you know, uh, uh, you know some kind of anguish we've had in a relationship or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, so that all of life then becomes this exercise in, in, in even larger than forgiveness. It, it becomes mm -hmm. a, an exercise in radical acceptance. And again, mm -hmm. it's not about, it's about finding those places that aren't free. And I think yes. it's easier to find the places that aren't free uh, in the face of death than mm -hmm. it is uh, when we are just puttering along trying to make sure there's not going to be a car accident or a run-in with a tax department. Mm -hmm. Those are mm -hmm. the kinds of things that keep us so preoccupied that we're not aware of the other more subtle contractions unless mm -hmm. we're really working hard at it. Mm -hmm. So appreciation of life, yes, but also the places finding the places where we aren't appreciating life is equally mm -hmm. important. It's yes. why, why, why we're so lucky to be faced with cancer rather than a car accident. Mm -hmm. Because we have, the, we have the luxury to work through those places that are yes. solidified, that can be seen ultimately to be just pure uh, contraction, to be, to be uh, shot through with that radiance that is in everything. Mm -hmm. Hmm. 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 And you know, hopefully, not hopefully, but you know, there's also possibility of if we allow life to be a teacher, you know, whenever contraction shows up, there's an opportunity there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of these contractions we don't notice until we're really faced right, right up against the wall. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've had a life of facing danger because just part of, I guess, my genetics. I, like my parents, have been, you know, attracted to extreme sports and, and you know, parachute jumping and kayaking in the Arctic and oh, hiking, climbing, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and, and so I've, I face the, the physicality of death, but it never actually uh, dropped into the uh, 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 illuminating contraction. Mm. And this illuminates contraction, cancer illuminates contraction in a way that uh, these mm -hmm. other experiences of risk-taking do not. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I guess I was speaking of contraction, not just in the physical sense of, of you know, risky kind of mm -hmm. activities, but, but in a very everyday sense of, you know, there being a, a, a frustration or a pain or an anger. Or fear, yeah, absolutely. In relation to something that has happened or another person. Mm -hmm. and. And you know when when we're willing to to inquire into that contraction, there's a chance right there. And you know, at the same time, I hear you that 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 facing death maybe really intensifies that 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 ability to really to really let go of. A lot of contraction, even the, the deepest yeah. ones. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to see clearly. It's mm -hmm. an invitation to see clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Which is beautiful. Mm. 
<laughs> we are always being invited to see clearly. Yes. 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 And and you know that that joy just beams out from you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you have any more questions, I'd be very glad to answer. Is there anything else? Um, let me see. Uh, I did have a list, so let me just quickly look at the list. You know, maybe the, the, most, um, the most important question would be, what would you like people to know right now, you know, as you're speaking about this, yeah. about this topic of facing death? Mm -hmm. what, what's the most important thing that you, you, you want to communicate? Yeah. Uh, well, number one, death only happens to the body. And number two, we are invited to recognize how deeply we are loved. We are love. We are made of love. The whole universe is hung together on the gravitational pull of love. And if there's anything that this is, what I'd like to share is, is becoming more and more and more aware of that experience of love. This isn't love, horizontal love. This is swimming in an ocean of pure capital L love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when we give ourselves to that love, we're ready to die. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much. Um, it's been Ray. such a it's been such a privilege to uh, to talk to you and um, just to just to experience that radiance. You know that that's probably the most important thing, more than anything that was said, because that is the gift of those who who move into this who are in this journey into the death of the body you know it just mm. becomes yeah not in everybody but in many it becomes more and more powerful and that is just such a precious gift so thank you very much <laughs>